for our time today. So, Father, we thank you for this time of study, for the time opportunity we have to gather together with you as we uh, look to share and understand uh, the 12 apostles, the men that you called, and uh, what happened to them, and some of the insights into who they are and, and what you did with their lives to carry on your message. So we thank you for this truth and understanding you give to us and the opportunity that we can learn that these 12 men are distinct, are unique, that you alone are the foundation, and there is no other foundation that you laid uh, outside of you other than these 12 men that continued on from your foundation of what you began to do and began to teach. They continue to teach and began, began to continue to do, as you stated in the book of Acts, these things that we're looking into as they carried on your message, your word, not their own. They moved not, as Peter says, of their own mind or volition, but as they were moved by the Spirit, as they were told, instructed, informed, and they were inspired. Yes, they were the writers, but we know that ultimately you are the author behind every word on every page of every book of the Scripture. 39 in the old, 27 in the new, as we call your holy word, we know that it is true and, and intact and without error in the original Old Semitic Hebrew and Koine Greek. So we look now to the understanding of how you forged the new side of this, what we call the New Testament, the ongoing life that you lived, recorded in the epistles then were written, as we mentioned, inspired by you. Give us insight and, and understanding and growth to see these men, how they apply to our lives the lessons they've learned and what they teach and equip us with and how you uh, grew them up. We pray all these things in Jesus, Yeshua's name, amen. So, a couple things to, to remind us. So we're going to be looking at the 12 apostles. This came because of, I think it was an appropriate time. I know it's kind of cheating because uh, Sister Vicki said, Let's, we, haven't we haven't studied that, we've studied that. And I know that's the last thing that someone said to study. And there's plenty of other things we're supposed to be studying. So she kind of leapfrogged the, the, the stockpile there to study this first. But that's because it, it seems to make sense in the context that we just covered the resurrection and we just covered the ascensions and we covered their disbursement and we did cover the book of Acts. So it makes sense to cover this. And this will take probably two Sundays with a Friday in between. So we're going to do this for two weeks and the Friday in between we should be able to cover all the 12 apostles um, from what I can see. Uh, but we'll see. You know, if Todd was here, he'd probably say, you mean four months? <laughs> uh, 12 apostles? I don't think so. I don't think so. As Vicky said, we never covered them before. Okay. Now, I covered them on the chart, how they align with the how they align with the tribes, but I didn't cover like oh, more. So yeah. where they where they went, I never talked about where they went, yeah, and right. I did cover like what their what their counterparts would be like in the Jewish tribe, absolutely. Uh, but I didn't cover them in the sense of what they uniquely did and what they contributed. So and how God used them, I should say, how God used them to contribute these things. So a couple of things that as a as a preface to this and precursor is that uh, we look at the twelve apostles in the context of we're we're not looking at Matthias, for example. Um, we're going to look at, I should say, the 12. We're going to look at 13 because we're going to look at Paul also because he's included in, in the apostles. So I'm going to say Paul, the 12 apostles, I'm going to put also um, plus one, plus one apostle Paul. So when I say 12 apostles, I want to make sure we also include a 13th in the Apostle Paul, because we are going to cover Judas and see a little bit about him. Even though he didn't do anything missionary work-wise, I do want to cover um, just about him as the person. Well, he'll, he'll be probably the last one. Well, he will be the last one we cover. Um, there are 12, with one more being 13, so Baker's Dozen, as they call it. Uh, ironically enough, of course, as we saw, there was the 14 tribes of Israel, if you think about it. There's 12 original, then Joseph was, it was, uh, Dan was taken out. Joseph was adding Ephraim and Manasseh. So there's a different aspect there. You also have Matthias taken out and Paul taken his place with Judas before that and Matthias taken his place. So there was different namings of the alignments there. Four, 12 core, but 14 on each one. And that's on chart. It's like 34 or something like that in your book. 33, 33 thank you. It's in there and it aligns that out. But so you look at, look at the, uh, the, the John as the apostle. What the goal is to look through every 12 apostles with, again, Paul as the additional. We want to look at the fact of what they were known for. Um, what is said in tradition of where they went and how their influence is in Christianity and what, if we have any comments of the church fathers, if you will, as we call the church fathers, the original first through third century fathers of the, of the congregation, I look to them. Once the Catholic Church gets into view, 312, B, uh, 312 AD 312, I don't really care too much about, you know, uh, put much weight into those people's sayings because they're influenced largely by the threat and fear and the influence of the Catholic Church. Uh, so I don't really put much stock into that. Um, some I do, some I don't. It all depends. But anybody in the, in the hundreds and the 200s, 
I definitely put stock in what they say. Uh, I'm going to put stock in what Josephus says about some facts because he lived in the time of the first century. Uh, Clement lived in the first century. Uh, in the second century, you have Origen um, uh, and uh, for the other, um, I think it's Sigisippus, I think right now. I can't, can't remember the other person's name. We're going to look there for a moment. Uh, oh, Eusebius, excuse me. Eusebius and Origen were both in the second, in the second century. So these people in the first, second century, I'm going to look and lean on them a lot for what they would say, being close to the events, this is what tradition they, they would hold to as being true. So I'm going to take that as, as more uh, weighted as valid versus someone who says hundreds of years later, well, we think this. Well, you're further from the true events, so I'm going to go with the early church fathers. You know, it makes sense, I would think. You know, I'm going to go with the most earliest people that are outside of Scripture that confer with Scripture of what they believe that's not recorded in Scripture, what really happened. So if they say, hey, I believe that uh, so-and-so went to this country, that country, uh, I'm going to go by those guys in the first and second century and hold much more weight to that than somebody who centuries later says, well, yeah, I think he went to this, this country too. I, maybe, but I'm going to put much more weight on the people in the first two centuries, okay? So I want to say some prefaces here for rules of engagement of how we're looking at these 12 apostles. So yes, I'm going to admit there's going to be some really freaky stories that you're going to see online. One in which is going to say that Thomas... That's right, Thomas the Apostle, they claim, is the only one who saw the assumption of Mary. Right, that, that's a lie. That's a total falsehood and ridiculousness. And they claim, watch this now, they claim that the Apostle said, watch the symmetry, we don't believe you. Sound familiar? And then he goes, oh, I'll show you. And then, um, and then really, that's just a spoof of ridiculousness to match up the true event of the resurrection that he didn't see. Eight days later, he was then shown evidence. So that's just not true. So now we go into the stories of, of what we see in the book of John in the Bible is that he was one of the sons of thunder, Mark 3.17 says so. He was the beloved apostle from John 13.23. He was also the privileged apostle. What do I mean by privileged? Because he was the one that Jesus said, uh, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. He had other brothers, but he chose John. He had other apostles. He chose John. Big deal. So John was beloved and he was privileged, no doubt. No doubt. And we always say this before, but it bears witness to say it again about him. It never gets old for me. He lived the longest. He was the only apostle at the cross. He was the first apostle at the tomb. And he's the apostle that saw the end of the world <laughs> come into fruition. He wrote Revelation, for crying out loud. So you think I think that's coincidence that he happened to have the longest life, the, 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 the emotional blessing of being there at the cross and having the endearment of his mother being charged to him and then see the end of things happen? Think that's just coincidence? No. Because he was the one that was privileged that Jesus loved. That's why. He said, that's right. That's right. He sat right next to him. That's why he had that privilege. So it's, it's claimed and, and suppose he died somewhere around AD 100. Now we don't know the exact year because on that issue uh, they said in Ephesus he was said to have been boiled in water and then poisoned but he didn't die. And they go, okay, you're going to Patmos, dude. We can't, you know, this is crazy. This guy, he, he tried to boil him in water, and they tried to poison him, and he couldn't, he didn't die. Because remember the scripture in Mark says, if you recall, if you go to Mark, let me show you this, to remind you, this is where our Pentecostal friends, God love them, they mean well, they say we could all do this, but they don't understand the context. So in the context, he was in Mark 16, verse 16, he said, and he, wait, well, first he says in verse 15, and he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the glad tidings to the whole creation. He who believes is immersed and will be saved, and he who be, believes will not be condemned. And these signs will accompany the believers in my name. They will expel demons. They will speak in new languages. They will take up serpents. And if they should drink deadly poison, it will not injure them. They shall lay hands on sick people, and they shall be well. So, and then he goes into verse 19 and 20, as we know. Then he spoke, then after he Lord has spoken these, taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. But then in verse 20, he tells you, and those having gone forth proclaimed everywhere the Lord, cooperating and ratifying the word through the accompanying signs. So he tells you, if you continue to read, unlike most people in, in churchianity, let the Bible expound the Bible. He tells you why the sign. Why, Lord, why? To ratify the word. Come on, man. They didn't know who was the follower of Jesus and who wasn't. So, they, so they, how, how would they know? The guys who did these crazy things that no one else could do. Drink poison, not die? That's insane. Raise the dead? Whoa. <laughs> you know? That, that's some, some stuff that they could know. Oh, wow, these guys cast out demons. Remember the story in the book of Acts where the guy tried to copy Paul, and demons go, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know. Who are you? And the guy was uh, 
pretty much mauled. Remember that? And his clothes were ripped and he was embarrassed. So it proves the point. This is how you know the true guys from the false guys. Because that's what was going on throughout the times of the apostles post-resurrection, post-Pentecost. Remember in, in Acts 8, we saw Simon the sorcerer try to buy the right to do these things. Remember, as a believer, he was trying to buy the right. Because you say, believer, yeah, remember. He believed and was baptized. We covered that, remember. And then after Philip says, well, I can't deal with this. Peter and John come to the rescue. Higher up station people come and say, not Philip the apostle, Philip the evangelist. And then boom, they come and then shabam, they, they tell him what's up. And then all of a sudden you see Peter say, you know, he can sees his heart and tells him, you're, you're, you're wicked in your heart. And he tells him straight away. Philip didn't say that. That wasn't the apostle. That was the evangelist Philip that went to, if you remember, Samaria. That wasn't the apostle. So when you see here in the book of Mark, again, the reason why there was ratifying the ratifying uh, the, the scripture was by these signs, which is why I think it's ironic that I, people say this is maybe not true. Some say it's one of the two. Either he was boiled in water and poisoned, and that's how he died, or he was banished on the island of Patmos. I say that they say one of the two. I say both happened. I say they tried to boil him, and they tried to poison him, and they, he, they couldn't kill him. And then you're going to find out later on the majority of the apostles were, were killed by beheadings or crucifixions or other kind of like, you know, physical death of like a, a knife through the heart, that kind of thing. Like they actually, you know, pierced their, their skin. They pierced their organs. Boiling in water and, and trying to poison them didn't work on John. John's most famous thing in his, in his writings, if, if people would just remember this, is he presents Jesus, Yeshua, as God Almighty. And as the eagle, if you will, of the four living ones description, because there's the, there's, the, there's the ox and the lion and the man and the eagle. Well, <laughs> John wants you to know uh, he's the eagle that soars high above all. He is God. He's the one gospel that presents him as God Almighty. And so his emphasis is on the deity, the divinity, the, the, the almighty nature of God Almighty and Yahshua. So much so that Clement, who he instructed, by the way, personally taught, wrote as a four, he wrote, and I quote, John composed a spiritual gospel, unquote. That's what he said. So Clement, the first church father, is like, he got no problem with not being part of the synoptic gospels. Because the synoptic gospels means that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the word sin means, means that they are together, and noptic means to see. So they saw together the same events similarly, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. However, John, if you can read the book, didn't do it like that. He didn't see the birth and all the stories and the resurrection the same way. He spent dominantly most of his book from chapter 13 on, chapter 12 on, is in the last week of Jesus. I mean, it's unbelievable. Half of John's book is on the last week of Jesus. We talked about that before. John is, is really caught up in the beginning of his, of his life a little bit. He scatters a little, little bit stuff throughout, but then he focuses dominantly on the last week plus couple days before that on his life. It, it is immensely emphasized on, on the person of his, of his redemptive act as being God Almighty. It's just really. So what he's known for is he introduced the great I am, which is I laugh at my Jehovah Witness friends when they say, Jesus never said that he was God. Really? You didn't read John then, did you? When he says, I am the bread of life, one. I am the light of the world, two. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Seven times. By the way, seven is the, God's complete number, right? So God completely established the end of the conversation that he never said. Well, then you just didn't read, did you? So those who want to say to you that question or that statement, when did Jesus ever, or Jesus never, yeah, he did. Seven times in John he records it. You say, well, that's the same thing. Yes, it is. To a Jew, it's even more than the same thing. That he is, because if you were a Jew hearing him say, I am, I am Chave, you, you, that's, that's crazy talk. That's why when he said, is it a ghost out there in the, in the ocean called to us? And he said, I am. And they're like, what? That freaked them out when they were in the Sea of Galilee, when the storm was raging. And they said, are you a ghost? And he said, I am. If you're a Jew hearing that, you're like, oh, he's got this. He can calm this storm and no problem. He parted the Red Sea. He, he stacked up the River Jordan. He had the ten plagues. He can handle a silly storm. And he speaks to the wind, remember? And then they go, even the wind listens to him. It's insane. By the way, no coincidence that in Corinthians later on, uh, Paul bring, brings up this whole issue about how, of course, Satan is, is the god of this world, if you will. They talk about that being the god. That's misunderstood. That's actually, remember we talked about that. It's not, people say it's Satan. It's not. Uh, but anyways, he, he does subdue 
uh, all nature and all things unto his existence, obviously. So John brings out the deity of Jesus, but tradition says he traveled to, well, he would know in the Bible, Samaria in Acts 8, but it says he went to Asia Minor, which is in this area right here. If you see on the, on the map, if you put a focus in on this, there's Ephesus where he was tried to be boiled in water and where they tried to poison him, and that didn't work. They put him in Patmos right there, and that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. Okay? So that, that's what happened to John. So John, that's him. Now, he was the first, he was the last one to die. Now, most people who study the apostles start off with Peter. I'm starting off with the one that was the, was the pinnacle of the beloved and privileged one. I think it's important to start off with the last one that died. Because his brother is James, he's the second one I want to go to. He was, ironically, the first one to die. Their book ends. Remember how Jesus, he, they said, Jesus, I want to sit on your right and your left. How ironic that one was the first and one was the last to die. They are bookends, but not the way they intended. Hello. Yeah. Pam said, wait, back up. Yeah, sorry. What did you say about the God of this world and Satan? Oh, sorry. Apologize. If you go back to the scripture, I wasn't going to. I stopped talking about it because I realized I was going down a rabbit trail. I didn't want to go down. But we'll go there because I mentioned it. It's my fault. <laughs> so if, because I mentioned it, that's on me. So if you go over to, um, we studied this just a few, um, just a few uh, weeks ago. And what's the verse here? Uh, let me see. Where is it? As in, is, I thought it was, is it 2 Corinthians or is it 1 Corinthians? Okay. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I was referring to. And here he goes. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, but in verse 3 and 4, but if indeed our glad tidings be veiled, they have been veiled to those who are perishing, to those unbelievers, who the minds, the God of this world, the God of this age, blinded in order that they might not see clearly the effulgence of the glad tidings of the glory of the anointed one who is the likeness of God. Now, so this is where I'm saying most people in churchianity say that's Satan. It's not. The God of this world, that's Jesus. <laughs> that's Jesus. It's the God of the age of this. Uh, it's, it's not Jesus. That's, it's, I mean, it's not Satan. That's Jesus. He blinds the eyes. The reason they say it's Satan is they go, oh, Satan blinds the eyes. They can't fathom in their thoughts that God would blind the eyes of people. But he does do that. He tells you that. In 2 Thessalonians, he sends them a powerful disillusion. They believe the lie. Is that Satan? No, God did that. Yeah, but he got, yeah, he says he, yeah, he hardens the heart of Pharaoh. He tells you so. God, so that's what I was trying to say about that. Is that uh, the the phrasing the God of this world is often used talking about Satan when they use this scripture in 2 Corinthians four three and four to validate that thought, but it's not speaking of him. It's speaking of Jesus, Yahshua, who blinds the eyes of people not to know who he is. So they say, why would he do that? Because he's God and he has glory to do what he wants. Just like the blind man when they said, why is a man born blind? Why do you do that? You just need to relax and listen to what Jesus said. When he said he, he was, was he born uh, blind because of a sin he did? No. His parents? No. Well, then Jesus, why? For the glory of God. Wait, 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 wait. You're telling me you made him blind and for years he, he, he was always blind. So at this moment in time, you could walk by and go, oh, just to show off? That's correct. So I could let you know that I have power over everything and anything in life. And you, I'm sorry that you see it that way, that I'm trying to be an arrogant show-off. That's not the case. I want to show you the power of an almighty, glorious God. In order to show you that, you have to endure pain and sorrow and suffering sometimes and trauma to understand and appreciate the depth of restoration and redemption and love and, and forgiveness and provision. Hello? You can't appreciate the depth of that unless you come through the darkness of it all. So that's why he's saying that. He says, the glory of God, he was born blind. Not because of anything he did or his parents did. So the same thing here. They weren't, they weren't made blind because God, God's a mean person. Because God wants you to appreciate that you were not made blind. He made you to see. Because you didn't see because you go, oh, I figured it out. No, because God awo awoken your spirit and he made you see. That's why you see. Not because you're smart, because you figured it out. That's not what happens. So I hope that answers your question. I apologize for going off topic. I didn't want to get there too much, but I mentioned it. It's my fault. So I hope I answered that question. Yes? God said in these verses 3 and what day are you seeing? Well, the God of the age this. So that's, you're talking about in day seven. So the God of the age this. So the unbelievers whose, whose minds, the God, he, so the unbelievers whose the minds, he says, and the whom, thus out of your margin, in whom the God of the age this blinded the minds of the unbelieving ones. So he's going to blind, he's, he blinded the eyes of people in day, the people in day seven, as we all, as we know, that are going to be 
and sinners, as we know, coming against the camp of the saints, right? As it is in day seven, as it is now, either case doesn't matter, but the emphasis is on the God of the age, this referencing Christ as the Messiah ruling from his throne, that even then, as it is now, he's the one who blinds the eyes of those who don't see him. He's the one who opens the eyes of those who see him. But don't mistake the fact that it's, it, even though Satan's running, running free now and he's chained later, it doesn't matter none. He's never in control of blinding your eyes. Never. That's the point. The point is, I don't care if you're talking about now or you're talking about later when he's chained. It's irrelevant. The God of the age is in control. Whether you, if you see him or if you don't, it's because he wants you to or he doesn't. Period. Don't try to say the demon of this, demon of that, Satan of this. No, it's not. Don't give him credit. He's just a thing. He's just a messenger who answers to the one who's in supreme rule. I hate people do that. It's the God of this. It's the Satan of that. The demon of this. No, it ain't. It's one God. He's in control of everything. Not, no, people say that, but he's not. Well, people, in the Old Testament, he's referred to as a small G God. They want to worship because God talks about how, you know, uh, their God answers. That's when Elijah said, let your God, which was Satan, they called him Baal, answer by fire. Tell you what, he doused the sacrifice with water and said, okay, is your God the God of fire? Okay, fine. I'll douse the sacrifice with water, and we'll see you answers by fire. And he, that's why he, Elijah's making fun, which I love that story. But he's like, going, what's the matter? Is he on vacation? Is he asleep, you know? And they're like, <laughs> funny. And then he douses the water, and then God just, poof, and he's right in the middle of it. doesn't get hurt. And they're like, that's pretty profound. Not only was it the, the, the sacrifice soaking wet, but you're in the middle of it. You didn't get burned. And the sacrifice has been taken. Fire comes down from heaven. Pretty much proves our God of fire. You just mocked him with your God who came down with fire, who's a consuming fire, and you did not get hurt. And the, the sacrifice was doused with water, and it still was consumed. That's insane. So they knew right away, this is crazy talk. But that's, they, that's why he just freely was throwing these prophets of Baal over the cliff. And no one stopped him. He's just one guy. <laughs> he's just, you're gone, and you're gone. And then all of a sudden, later on, Jezebel gets mad. It's pretty crazy when you think about that. He's one guy against all these hundreds of people just casting them off. And all of a sudden, everybody, everybody's just going, okay. You know, and then all of a sudden, Jezebel hears about it, and he, she tells Ahab, are you nuts? You got the whole army. You could just stop. He's one guy. And so that's when Elijah gets scared and runs. You know, it's kind of a crazy story. Anyway, yes? Todd said, what is the definition of unbelievers in verse 4? Okay, so uh, 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 pistoi, so in that, in that particular uh, pistoi is the, the word for people who have faith. So the unbelieving, they, they, they use the word faith for believing. It's, there's different words for believing here. This word is pistoi, which is the word we can use for faith or belief. So that's why it says awe is no, and then pistoi is faith or belief, but it's used dominantly for the word faith. So it's those who have no faith or no belief. So that's what that means. So who are the people? Though it can be either kind of people. They can be people that are that are in that are of covenant or in Christ. That that's what they're by the way, remember, when he uses that word unbeliever, he's not referring uh, largely to those that are not of covenant, to your point. Every time he uses that word unbeliever, he's dominantly looking at people that are either in testament for the most part, and there are sometimes he looks at folks that are of covenant, that aren't in testament yet. So they're not believing in Christ as the, the Messiah in the flesh of God Almighty. But either case, it's the family of God of covenant or in testament that's in view when he says unbeliever. Not the rest of the yahoos in the world, no offense to them. I'm just saying it's not the rest of the peoples. It's to those two groups of peoples. All right? So that's who the unbelievers are. But specifically to this passage, I personally would say to you it's those that are, that are in that place of being of covenant, those who came through tribulation, who then believed in him as the Messiah. But remember, they procreate. And when they procreate, what happens? Are they in testament? No. They got to make a choice. They got to be ordained, if you will. We make a choice, we say free will, but it's not. It's the choice that God has now manifested in time, what he has preordained before time. So the choice that they make in time reveals to us before time what God already has decreed. Will they or will they not be in testament? And so many of those are unbelievers that he is the Messiah. That's why they're duped into going with Satan and getting crushed by the fire that consumes them, if you remember in the lake of fire, and they stay there forever. Yes? Todd said, what is the word you would use for the yahoos that don't have <laughs> Jesus as their Messiah? <laughs> I, you, you can say, <laughs> you can say infidels. Uh, it's a good one. That's my, that's, my, that's my modern 21st century word, yahoo. So you, 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 can, you can say infidels because the scripture does say in, in Timothy, that if a man of faith uh, does not care for his own family and provide, which is spiritually and, and, and practically, 
that he's worse than an infidel. So that person of faith would be a person of covenant faith in the God of Moses or testament faith of, of the house of Christ. Either way, if you don't live in regard to what scripture you do have to provide for your family, spiritually and physically, then you are worse than an infidel. So therefore, he's comparing people of covenant and testament separate from those that are not. So he calls them infidels. So I would say infidel is a good word you could use. Yes. God said in the Bible, and yeah. they bring him down, he said wackadoodles. Wackadoodles, that's a good one. Yeah, I like that. I'll show you in the Bible. Yes, I'll show you. Well, I, did, I just quoted you. I just quoted you a verse in the Bible, that's in. Uh, quoted you a, a verse there. It's in. Let me see here. It's in chapter five of Timothy. Oh, wait a minute. You know what? You're right. You know what? I'm looking at the English rendering. My apology. You're right, brother Todd. Thank you. So I'm going by memory of the English rendering. Good, good catch. I'm now reading it in verse 8 of the First Timothy 5, and the word there is worse than an unbeliever. So, so he says there, but if anyone provide not for his own relatives, this is First Timothy 5, 8, if anyone provide not for his own relatives, and especially for his family, he has denied the faith, the faith, and has denied, and he is worse than an unbeliever, which is the same word there, apistos. So it tells you, well, it doesn't say the word infidel, but let's just say that that's the word that the English rendering says, I was remembering, my apology. But the thought is the same. He's saying you're worse than an unbeliever. So if an unbeliever is the only person who's in testament or a covenant, because remember, in Hebrews, they didn't enter because of their unbelief. You can be an unbelieving believer in testament, or you can be an unbeliever of covenant, not, not believing in the God of testament, right? So there's two kinds of unbelievers. There's the unbeliever in testament who doesn't want to ongoingly trust in God through Christ's provision. And there's the unbeliever in covenant who doesn't want to believe that God is Christ in testament who shed his blood those are the two unbelievers whereas he says here you're worse than any of those people when you deny the faith of not providing for your family you're denying the faith you not provide for your family which is the spiritual physical practical sense yes Todd said all of churchianity views the word unbelievers as enemies of Christ destined for hell I know and they're wrong and how you can really the one verse above all that can help you to clear that up is the one in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 3. I know we're off topic, but that's okay. We go as the Spirit leads. That's what makes us us. And those who are hearing us and not knowing who we are, you can go to www.pfbcstudies.com and see all of the things that we believe and all the things you can see online. So as you go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 3 for context, in verse 12, he says, Beware brethren. So who's brethren? Is that the whole planet Earth? No. I mean, let's get real. He's talking to those who believe in Christ clearly, right? Lest there should ever be any one of you evil with an evil disbelieving heart. Huh? Well, he's addressing brethren. So brethren can be disbelieving. And if you, I know, but they don't believe that though, remember? <laughs> so if you look at the word for unbelief there, it's the same word again, unbelief, different, you know, uh, grammatical Suffix at the end, but same word, apistos, uh, apistas in that one. But apostatizing. And the reason why they don't believe this is they would say, well, he wasn't really a believer. They were 18 inches short from their head to their heart, and that's why they're naming it. Oh, please. That's malarkey. Here it says, brethren, and you should be a disbelieving heart by apostatizing. The reason they don't believe that an unbeliever can be a believer, you could be an unbelieving believer, is because they don't understand that apostasy refers to only those who are in Christ. Are you crazy right now? How can you apo from, stand, how can you stand away from what you don't even know? That makes no sense. I can't stand away, I can't stand away from, we're not gonna do, not gonna do, I don't know what that even means, right? How can I stand away from that? I don't know what it even means. So if you're speaking Swahili to me, I have no, I can't stand against what I don't understand. I don't even know what you're talking about. But if, if I know something, and you've told me something, and I've been given something, well, then I can stand away from it or I can embrace it. That's what apostasy means, apostasis, to stand away from. It's so crazy how they don't see it. But I, I don't know. That, that's just, but keep reading. But exhort each other day while I call today so that no one among you may be hardened by delusion of sin. This is Hebrews uh, 3.12. And you keep on going down where he says in verse 14, you became associates of the anointed. If indeed, if indeed you hold fast, now is the condition about you you're becoming an associate, he talks about in the left-sided margin, that's medicoy, a partaker. If 
you do something, not by grace through faith now, it's about works of, of while, while you're already in Christ by faith, apart, apart from works, now you have to have works to hold fast to the beginning of your confidence to be, in a, to be a medicoy. In regard to declaration, you should hear the voice, harden not your hearts, and the bitter provocation for who having heard did provoke, did not all those who came out from Egypt under Moses. He's basically telling you what he tells you later in 1 Corinthians, or earlier in 1 Corinthians. He says, hey, uh, they were all baptized unto Moses. All. But didn't some die later on, didn't they? they get, didn't they get burned by fire and those who didn't, the earth swallowed up? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> That's not funny. So in verse 17, he says, and with who he was displeased 40 years, was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the desert, and to whom did he swear they should not enter in his rest, if not to the disbelieving? And we shall not, and we, and we, and we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Now the whole, if you put that verse, that coupling of verses, alongside of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and again, I'm just, we're off topic, but this is an important question you're asking me. And I got a, is it 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians? I'm sorry about that. I think I got a mistake right there. Uh, that's 10. What, what, I'm off totally here. It's 1 Corinthians 10, I believe. Yes. Yes, 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, and he says in verse 1, For I wish you not to be ignorant, which is what churchianity is today. Ignorant. Ah, uh, no, and, and the gnosis, no knowledge of. No, we are. No basic knowledge of what? Brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud. And all, second time he says it, passed through, passed through the sea. And all were immersed into Moses and the cloud and the sea. And that all ate the same spiritual food. And that all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock which followed them. But the rock was the anointed. You're going to tell me that all is being used. Let's see, uh, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4. Right, you're going to tell me one time, you see, no, five, verse one, one, two, three, four, and let me see, remember, all through the sea, all were immersed, all ate, all drank, and he, he uses that term, and you're going to tell me that that's not referring to all the buddies that came out of Egypt, and therefore that those who die because you can't deal with how God judged them, all of a sudden they're not, they're not covered by the same Passover blood that made them in type a symbol of being in Christ. You don't, you're not going to all of a sudden agree with that all of a sudden because of how God treated them later on? It's just, that's the problem you're going to run into with people. But the point is, can you show them a scripture? Can you show them why a person who's in belief can be an unbeliever? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Now, we can hold different subject matter, but to read more about that, go back to the Word document of Salvation of the Soul, and the very first part of that document, I cover this issue. I cover this issue with scriptures and with explanations. But I, I give you enough today to answer that question, not to get too far off. Yes? And Teresa said, right, Todd, I've been preaching unbelieving believers in the lunchroom for years. Yep. And Todd said, I see the unbelieving believer, but if the word unbeliever is used as a separate word, I think they are enemies of Christ. It's a, correct. Remember, I, I mentioned to you, unbelieving believer, it can be in testament. Or it can be an unbelieving believer of covenant. So you're not in Christ. You're of covenant. But you don't believe in the God who's in testament in the person of Yahshua. Remember? I mentioned. I just I said that. So there are two types of unbelievers. But never is an unbeliever on the outside of covenant. That's not the case. They're either in covenant, not believing in testament. Or they're in testament, not believing in the ongoing work that's needed to show your trust and obedience unto God through Christ. It's that simple. It's really that simple. Because you cannot be an unbeliever unless you first were given belief to believe. So you were given a covenant belief to do what? To lead you to Christ. Because Galatians said so. The law was the pedagogue, the tutor, to go, and here's Joshua. And you go, no. Well, then you're an unbeliever then. The whole purpose of your given covenant was to lead you to Jesus. What don't you understand? And they go, I don't care. I don't care. Well, that, that, that's on you. Then you're in Christ, and you go, all I got to do is just, I believe, and I'm good. N no. No. No, no, I didn't spend three and a half years just telling you grace through faith. He taught them how to live their lives. He told them that there's a, there's a benefit and a consequence. What do you think the Ebom Garrison mountains were about, shouting out the blessings and cursing? What do you think that was about? I told you time and time again in the Old Testament, if you do this, I'll do this for you. If you don't, I'll do this to you. But don't you understand? <laughs> yes, it's a unilateral covenant. That means I'll do it all for you, get you initial salvation in Christ. But the ongoing 
covenants I've made were also bilateral. It requires you to do something. They know this. So live like it. In Testament, it doesn't change any. It's the same principle. I get you initially, all on me. I got you in Testament, God would say. But after that, you got, we got to collaborate here. You got, you, got to, you, got to, you got to show forth that you got to be the branch abiding in me to bear forth fruit, or else you got no shot. Are you still a branch? Yeah, but I will cut you off, John 15. I will cut you out like nobody's business. Don't play with me. Yes? Tracy said there's so much they don't see, more than one salvation, actual 1,000-year kingdom, et cetera, et cetera, oh, yeah. et cetera, name the movie. Oh, yeah. And, and Pam, uh, Pam said, at your lunchroom, Tracy, they are told there is no 1,000 years, so any understanding of this is completely unavailable to them. Yeah, and so, so I want to make sure we're clear about the unbeliever. When Christ is not in view, to Todd's point, yeah, if it's just said apart from anybody in Christ, then yeah, you could be referring to somebody who's of covenant. But remember, we're not ever seeing the word unbeliever be referred to as those who are not of covenant. Okay? So an unbeliever is either a person in testament who refuses to continue to walk in sanctification in Christ, or a person of covenant who rejects the person of Christ as God Almighty, who will cover them with his blood. Because the whole reason you're in covenant was to lead you to Christ. And if you reject that, then you're a believer in God, but you're an unbeliever in what his, what his purpose was. So the context will set you free. That's why Jesus said, had you believed Moses of covenant people, you'd believe me. He wrote of me. But you don't. Later on in, in, in John 5, he goes to John 8, fast forward, and he says, if you believe Abraham, you'd believe me. But if you don't, that means you're, you're a child of the devil. Your father is Satan. Hello? That is crazy talk. <laughs> the people of covenant, they were like, whoa, 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 whoa calm down. He's like, no, I'm not going to calm down. You're unbelieving. Being a believer in the law of Moses, you should know who I am. <laughs> Come on. That's what he's saying. So the proof is in the, in the scripture. Don't no, no matter what I say. It's re- the Bible says it clearly. Jesus said, if you're a covenant, you're supposed to believe me. And if you don't, then you're an unbeliever. He said it. In so many words or less, he said that. Same as in the New Testament. We saw it right here again. Yes. Todd said, <clears throat> Todd said okay. Pam said, I'm saved, God loves me, and I'm going to heaven. If that's all they believe, they need to know, Sam. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I, I get emphatic when I say this stuff. I apologize. But it's just, it's just, it's just you know, I don't know. People just uh, believe what they want. But, but great question, great comment, great insight. It's, it's just a confusing issue from uh, church sanity. I blame church sanity because the bottom line is the basic tenet that leads them to misunderstanding is generalization. They want to generalize, and God wants to specify. So who are you going to go with? If there was teams to choose from, there's the generalized team and the specified team. And if they're going to go to the Bible and study it, who would you choose to be on that study group with? It's that simple. It's that simple. You've got two rooms to go into and a congregation. One says, we want to study the scripture generally speaking, and we want to study it specifically speaking. Who do you want to go to? Which classroom are you going to go to? That's how I'd ask people the question. Which, one, which room would you go to? Okay, be careful what you answer. If you go over here, then we've got to get serious now. Because now you're saying you want to be a student of the Old Semitic Hebrew, the Koine Greek, and the culture and language gap, and you got to do that. If not, then you want to generalize, so you're in the wrong classroom. Go over there. I'm not going to belittle you. You're still in Christ. But don't lie to me and say you care about specific specifications of God's Word when, in fact, you don't want to regard those things that are important to do that. So you have to go over here if you want to generalize. That's fine. But don't lie to me and say you're not what you are. As, as, was it Shakespeare? You know, to your own self be true? Stop lying. If you want to generalize, then fine. Go to the generalized camp. If you want to specify, let's go to the student camp. And let's get real. That, that, it's your choice. But that's the basic difference between church sanity and Christianity in the Bible. Church sanity generalizes. Christianity is very specific. Because why? Because God is very specific. You don't believe me? Look at nature. Look at the body. Look at the scripture. Look at the temple. Look at God himself. Give me a break. So, all right. Now, back to our scriptures. Back to our program show. <laughs> a scheduled program, right? All right, so James the brother of John, to make sure you reference this too. I, I learned also from doing this study a lot of things myself, which always happens when you're studying and, and equipping. There's an old saying and you're doing preaching or teaching is that you preach from an overflow. There's always more that I gained insight on that I could ever give out because I just maybe um, see it differently and it's hard to retain and give all that to you that I've been inspired by God. But I do give out, as far as I know, I'm giving out everything I can recollect. Um, so... In James, he's the son of thunder. But in James, there's always the question of which James it is. That's always the question in Scripture. 
The biggest issue with John that always comes up when someone mentions his name, they go, ooh, the beloved one, the privileged one who cared for Mary. That always comes up. Or the gospel of John is not a subnoptic gospel. That may sometimes come up. Or John the Revelator, that comes up. But when you get to James, what comes up first is, okay, which James? That's always, it always comes up. When you talk about, you're studying the Bible, and you go, James, you go, okay, which one? What do you mean which one? Well, is it James of Alphaeus, James the Lesser? Is it James the Apostle James, son of, Zeb son of, son of Zebedee, son of Thunder, John's brother? Or is it James the one who was in Jerusalem at the council, who ran the show, who clearly Paul said, and you know, he gave you know, kind of a, a bow to James saying, no, get, let James know. So Paul made it clear. James made it clear. He was in charge of Jerusalem. He was the guy. So is the James the apostle related to James the guy who was the council leader in Jerusalem or the epistle of James? And the answer is he's not. Now, I myself for years have gone back and forth on this myself, just to be honest with you about it, and just to be honest with you about it, because I'm just a human being who's a sinner. What to me, I'm, I'm going to base my decision on is what I said before, I preface with, the first and second century forefathers. If they say that this is who they thought James the council person was, this is what they say, the epistle of James, who that was, I think they have a better chance of getting it right than I do, because they were right there. They were in the first and second century. And guess what Josephus says about the James of the council of Jerusalem, who that was? He says it was, it was Jesus' half-brother. He says that. They were, as a matter of fact, he says he was amazed because he knew what the Scripture said when it says his family, no one believed in him until after the resurrection. And they found it to be amazing that after the resurrection, this, this, this brother, this other child of Mary, would now be so much a believer that he would head a council in Jerusalem. Wow! That says a lot about James. You're talking, that many people go, that's too soon. No, 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 no. AD 34, right? Crucifixion. AD 50, Jerusalem Council. There's 16 years in there. That's plenty of time for James, the half brother of Jesus, to come to belief and to grow like a weed, to be like, you know, like the Apostle Paul grew within months to being from not knowing to, you know, knowing what he knows. So you gave a guy 16 years? Come on. That's plenty of time to grow to be a very astute elder statesman of the congregation in Jerusalem. So with that being said, that's not this James. So James is not the guy in the Council of Jerusalem. Count that out. So Clement, Origen, Eusebius, and Josephus all say, this is the brother, this is not the brother of, of uh, Jesus. This is the Apostle James, the brother, the brother of John, but the one in Jerusalem is the brother of Jesus, the one born from Mary. They all say that. You know what they also say? He was the, he was the same one who wrote the epistle, James. That, that's the part I was kind of like, really? Because I kind of toy with the idea, maybe that was James of Alphaeus, or maybe that was James, the brother here. And they say no. Those early church fathers, not Josephus, he's not included in that one. But the early church fathers, when it comes to the epistle, they, Origen, Eusebius, and Clement say that he wrote, um, that James, the brother of Christ, wrote the epistle of James. So what did this James do then? Did he write an epistle? No. Are there other people out there that say he did write a gospel that was later discovered in the 1940s and onward with the other uh, what I say, Yahoo Wackadoodle Gospels, uh, which will cover, which by the way, um, if you're wondering, I'll give you a little preamble for this. So the, the Gospel of, of Thomas, for example, and the other Gospels, the reason they were thrown out is because they didn't include certain things. Oh, like for example, did you know that the Gospel of Thomas, that's often quoted by people, um, did not include the crucifixion or the resurrection of Jesus. Kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. Didn't include it at all. Or the life, or the birth. Birth, crucifixion. Are you serious right now? The three most important events of his life, they didn't, he didn't record. So that's why Eusebius, for one, and other people said, that's heretical, we're throwing it out. There's no way that's inspired by God when you overlook the, light, the birth, the, the, the death, and the resurrection. That's insanity. There's no way that what, what Thomas did, the Gospel of Thomas, was a collection of sayings of Jesus, which is what the other Gospel accounts were similar to that they're not in the Bible. These other extra biblical accounts of Gospels that were found in the 40s onward, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Thomas, and Judas, and Peter, and the one of James the Apostle, they're all basically a man's take of some view of how they felt about things or a collection of sayings of Jesus. But none of them, chronology, chronolo, how do you say it? Chron, chron, no, chronicle, that's the word I'm looking for. They don't, they don't chronicle the life of Jesus nor do they mention the birth, resurrection, and death of Jesus, nor do they go through the whole process of the consistency of anything you see from the other writers of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. 
All right, so that's why they're not included. So I'll get that up front so people who may be questioning. Well, I've heard and other people say there isn't a, there isn't a, uh, a book of James that the apostle did write. It says here, yeah, but it's not included because it's either the sayings of Jesus or it's just a thoughts of James that someone else wrote down or maybe he wrote down on his own. It's debatable. Either someone else wrote it down from hearing about his stories or he wrote it down possibly. We don't know, but either case, it's not inspired by God. How do you know? The birth, the death, the resurrection is not included, and nor is the chronicling of his life on the events that we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's no mention of any of those events and those gospel accounts on the same level. There's maybe one or two, and that's about it. So, James, the first one of the apostles to die. In AD 44, in Jerusalem, as we know from Acts chapter 12, 1 to 2. But what you, what you didn't know is when Herod wanted to kill him, you know why he wanted to kill him? Well, I didn't know this either. I was studying it. He was the most feared due to his strong convictions. Now, I did tell you about how he, he, he was killed. I told you this, how he was jailed, and if you recall the tradition, where he was, a, was a, he was a warrior. He was a strong, buff guy. So he would fight with the Jews alongside the Jews that were not believing in Christ. He would fight for them not to be persecuted by the Romans. They were still his brothers. And then those who were in Christ, he fought for them too, not persecuted by the Romans. Because remember, Jews back then, believing in Christ of covenant, I mean, and testament, or not believing, not believing in Christ of covenant, they hung out together in peace. Well, except for the Sanhedrin people, they weren't so nice, right? But the Pharisees, Sadducees, and all, those were all. But the regular Jewish people of covenant and testament got along just fine. The Sanhedrin folk are the ones that were the anti you know, establishment, remember? And remember this. Remember, it takes a little backdrop to remember this. It wasn't until after the death of John that the Romans began to see Christianity as a different belief system from Judaism. You can't forget that. Remember? The Romans believed that Christianity was nothing more than another version of Judaism, like Pharisaical belief, Sadduceical belief, Essenian belief was all different variations of one Judaism. They saw Christianity as one more variation of Judaism because they saw Jesus, Yeshua, as a, just another Messiah. And it wasn't until after the death of the last apostle that shortly thereafter they started to realize these Jews are fighting amongst themselves. What's going on here? And they realized, oh, because they're saying they're not just different in their belief system of Judaism. They're anti-Jewish because they're saying all these other people are saying that Jesus, Yeshua, is not the Messiah. And they're saying he is the Messiah. That's a big demarcation of difference. And then they started to realize that. And that's when the Romans started to say, that's why they wanted to go kill Christians for. Now you see why that was. They turned on them because they said, oh, 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 no, 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 no. Now it's hunting grounds for these guys. Because they're the ones causing the, the, the uprising. So if we can just, we already know how to appease the Jews. Is we can just, you know, make sure we always give them what they want. We did that with the whole Jesus thing, killing him. So we're going to kill these other people too. So the, the cross of James, as you remember, is, is this cross that you see that has that, that has this um, like a like an arrow. Well, I can't even do it. Ah, shame on me. But it's like a, it's like a, like a pointed. I just do it like this. It's a pointed cross. Oh, why am I having a hard time doing this? But anyway, it's that it's that point. Oh my gosh, what is wrong with me? But it has that like a little point to it, like this, like a little point at the bottom. It's got those points. So th this little pointed cross like that that came from James, the Apostle James, and the reason why it became his symbol is because he was beheaded by a sword. And because when he was beheaded by the sword, it was said that he's a, this is this really warrior fighting testosterone guy who, again, the Roman soldier standing next to him saw him so peaceful and serene, leading up to his trial, leading up to his execution. He said, surely this man is touched by God and God hasn't changed his life. He said, I want to be killed by the same sword that killed him. And of course, Herod's like, no problem. And he beheaded him too. So that's the tradition, not in the Bible. That's tradition. But what is tradition is they say that it's this cross that you see with these points on it. Whenever you wear that cross or see that cross, its origin came from James because it was a picture of a sword. It reminds him of a sword that he was the first martyr of for, for the cross of Christ. That's why the, 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 the angles of the cross, the top, the bottom, and the sides, it reminded them. And because of the story of the Roman soldier being also beheaded because of the testimony of Christ in James, they, they feel like this is one sword, that's the other sword that testified of how Christ uh, was in James's life to, to bring um, even, a, even, a, even a death, a fellow you know, person outside on the outside world into that belief and testament. 
So when it comes to James also, what you see, there's a couple of other things too. Uh, he was in the, in the scripture, in, in, the, in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew tongue, his name is not Jacob. I mean, James is, is, is Jacob. That's his name in the Hebrew tongue. So Jacob. So basically, Todd Pan, your son, uh, Jack, Jacob, is named after an apostle, whether you knew it or not, right? <laughs> Pretty cool. So people think that James is the real name of the apostle, and it's not. Just like Matthew was actually Matthias, just like Matthias in the book of Acts, that was Matthew's real name in the Bible. Just like Peter was actually Cephas, right, or actually Simon Barjona. He called him Cephas. Uh, so this is his Hebrew name is, is Jacob. So with that, with that being said also, it, they say that, they say in this case, uh, now tradition says, is there a question there, a statement, babe, or comment? Um, Pam said, um, Y-A-C-O-B. Yeah, they say Jacob, because there's no J sound, and that's correct, Y, it's, that's correct. So it's, so in the Hebrew tongue you say, yeah, so if I want to be technically, so it's a, it's a Jacob like that, it's a Y, you're correct. Jacob. But we would say Jacob, because we say J sounds in English, but the Hebrew would say Jacob. So it's Jacob for us. Yeah, and so in tradition, they tradition claims that that his influence went to now he didn't go there, but his influence, I should say, um, is revered, I should say. In India and Spain. Now I'll tell you why in a minute. And then they, and in Spain, in Spain, they call in, the, in their tongue, they call him Santiago. So when you see a Latino's name with Santiago, that's in the heritage of the Saint James that they regarded. Over in Spain. Now, why do you say this? Here's why. Here's why. If you go over to Romans, this is why they say this. I'm going to tell you why. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just trying to show you a verse. So, if you go over to, to Romans, and I got to find, I should have looked into the verse real quick. I didn't write it down. I didn't write it down, but it's what Paul mentions about um, Spain, if you remember in the book. Here it is right here, Romans uh, 15 and verse 23 and 24. But now having no longer a place in these regions and having for many years a strong desire to come to you, whenever I may go into Spain, I hope passing through to see you and to be sent forward by there, if first I should partly satisfy with your society. Now that's in Romans 15, 23 and 24. That's the only mention you have of Spain. People then by tradition say the reason why the, the Apostle James is not mentioned from A.D. 34 to A.D. 50, a lot of the Apostles aren't mentioned. I mean, a lot of them, let's get real. But they're saying, but wait a minute, he's not some regular Apostle though. True. He's one of the three that Christ always took with him, Peter, James, and John. So that's a different argument. You could say, well, Bartholomew uh, and, and, and Thaddeus and, and Philip, they aren't mentioned either. Well, that's true. It's true. Jude and all the rest of them weren't mentioned either. Thomas wasn't really mentioned. But the reality is, in the book of Acts, we're talking about, right? But it doesn't mean they weren't there. But, there are, but the argument from tradition is, James would have to be mentioned because he was a prominent figure in the life of Christ. So they contend, now I'm not saying this is true, that tradition contends that James was traversing under the influence of Paul, which is why Paul mentions Spain, is because James went to Spain after Paul's conversion hearing that Paul wanted to go out to Gentiles. Because Paul, if you recall, was, was converted in the AD 44 range, and then AD, it was, it was later on he went to Antioch, but he was an outcast for a while. You remember, for three years taught by Christ, then he went to Antioch for a year. So many people believe that in that time where Paul was being taught by Christ, that, and he went to Antioch, and then later on there was the Council of Jerusalem, in between that AD 44 period 
in AD 50 period that James was more than, they think he was more than likely in Spain. There's no proof of that other than Spain itself saying, they claim there's relics there of the Apostle James. They claim that. But there's no early church father that confers this story. There's no one that confirms this story at all. Okay, it's all tradition. No one of the, no, no Clement, Origen, Hesipus, the, guy, the, the, uh, the guys in the early Eusebius, the guys in the first, second century, none of them collaborate this story. But they do later on say, well, there are relics in these areas, and they do claim that he influenced these people. Okay, fine. Uh, I'll go with he influenced them, but I'm not going to go with he went there. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I, there's nothing that says he did, nothing that says he didn't. But remember, he dies in AD 44 is the problem. So how does he go to Spain if, in fact, he had to go there between 44 and 50? If he's dead in 44, how do he go? <laughs> so, that makes no sense. There's no sense. So that's where I kind of go, I don't think so. I think it's more of his influence got over there because of how he lived his life. That's my, my take on it. I'm just giving you why, what they say and what you're going to read about and what you'll hear about. But you got to align that with the timeline, too, and go, wait a minute. If you're saying he traversed over there between 44 and 50, he was dead in 44. So what are you talking about? So he couldn't have gone over there. He was dead. So that, that's the whole, you know, I think it's more of his influence more than anything else. So also about James, the Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese people also, because obviously it's not on the map, but Spain's over this way, right? So over this, so you have Spain, the big chunk of Spain. Of course, you got Portugal over here, right? So Portugal is in the same region, right? So the Portuguese, they, they took, they spread, I'm, I'm looking at my notes. So the Portuguese, they spread James' influence, you'll love this, to Africa, specifically the Congo. The Congo region. So that's what they say the Portuguese did. Now, again, he didn't go there, okay? They're saying his influence went there, which is why their proof of this is there's this name Santiago, which comes from a transliteration of his name being taken over to their uh, Spanish speaking, and then they get Santiago. But this, they, Portuguese also spread James to the Congo. And let's see what else. Uh, oh, and then from there, and then from there, Spread, you'll love this, spread to Haiti and Puerto Rico, which is crazy, which is why you have Puerto Rican people with the name Santiago. Now, that does make sense. Now, the collaboration of this tradition makes some sense to me because I do know Latino people with the name Santiago that are not just Spanish, but they're Puerto Rican. That makes sense because <laughs> you, you find that name quite frequently amongst all kinds of Latinos, not just Puerto Ricans, but Portuguese people, Spanish people. And India is interesting, though. There's no really evidence of that. People just say that because there's some relics they claim were there from him. So this is, again, he didn't go there. His influence was carried there because of his testimony of how he died. So I think it's more of he died as the first demonstrative way in which an apostle was, was so hated and murdered that that word got out and, and went around. And so I think this, the Indians, uh, the, the, as in the country of India, they and Spain were the first two that gravitated to that and just decided to revere that as, as the memory of the first apostle that died. That's, I, don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. I get the purpose of that. Back then, even more so than ever, you would, there, were, there were always iconic moments. You would remember things that were important. Kind of important if, if, if you're a Messiah that you believe in died and rose again from the dead, your next point of influence would be on those who carry on his message. And the first one just got murdered. You might want to remember that. And so Spanish people being one of they want to have memorials to that. Everyone did back then. They did a memorial, and that got carried over, and that got spread, and so on and so forth. So, but that's, that's, the, that's the guy of James. Now, James, I didn't know this myself, but he was known after, after uh, Paul and Peter. They say he was the best orator of them all, saving those two guys. So they say that James, in tradition, was the best spokesman outside of Paul and Peter. Take away Paul and Peter as the two guys, which everybody knows are the two voices and faces of Christianity, but third in line was James. Pretty profound stuff to say. That's, that's, not, that's not slouch company, man. Those guys spoke a lot in front of leaders and charges of people that had authority over them. 
By the way, we get to it later. I didn't know this either. That Peter and Paul died in the same year in Rome in different parts of the city. I didn't know that. Interesting. That's what tradition says. That was also very interesting to me. But that's, you know, we're getting it forward, fast forward here. But again, so James is an interesting character. Now, he's known. Let me see here. He, he's known, <clears throat> of course, as we know, that he, with, with John, so with John, his brother, he's known as the sons of the, one of the sons of thunder. But he's known for two things. They, they, he was the older brother of the two. So he was the older brother. So as the older brother, as the older brother, and knowing that John was the one that Jesus loved, and knowing he was the privileged one, many people attribute the comments we're about to look at, what James is known for, is more him and John just being the younger brother going along with, than versus it being John who leads the way and James is going along with him. So James is the one that said the famous, um, we want to we want to sit, um, you know, grant us, grant us sit at your right and left. So many say that it, again, because James is the is the older, it was him who led that comment, and John was just you know accompanying him because the mother put him up to it. But James is the older one; it makes sense he'd be the voice of that question too. But it says James and John, but it's like it said in the, in the book of Acts, remember? It says Peter and John, but John didn't speak. Peter spoke, and they attributed both to, to Peter, as we, as we, to both of them, I should say, as we saw in the book of Acts uh, last Friday. So Peter and John would speak, but um, it would be, be present, excuse me. Peter and John would be present. Peter would speak. They would attribute the statements to both of them, which is were same as James and John. James would be speaking dominantly, but they would contribute that to James and John because John would be in partnership with and go, yeah. So he'd be in agreement with, but I would argue, and many in tradition argue, given John's status of being the beloved, being privileged, Jesus loved him, that he was more so the younger influential brother of the older brother, just going along with, because mama said, and older brother said, he just went along. So it wasn't really his intent. But secondly, he's also, this is, by the way, the scripture for that is Mark, Mark 10, 37, when they say set the right and the left. But the other uh, scripture that he says is he says, rain down fire from heaven. If you remember that, he says, rain down fire from heaven. And that was on the Sumerians. So these are the two statements that James is known for. And this is, uh, let me see here. We're looking at Luke 9. Two and fifty-four. So he's known for these two statements, and these two statements are ones in which show the um, no holds barred attitude that James had. You can see why Herod was scared of him being a person he feared because of his strong convictions. If you're not afraid to ask the Lord God Almighty to sit in your right and left, and you got the moxie to tell God to, to destroy somebody, you got some kahunas, man. You got some big kahunas that you have this this no fear. Of approaching God Almighty Himself and saying, "I want to sit in your right and left with my brother here." Oh, and by the way, kill these people. That that that's pretty boisterous, you know, right? So that's why Herod said, "This guy is a dynamite cracker, man. He, we got to take him out." He's the he, Peter may be the voice right now in the face of Christianity, and Paul now took his place. But this guy's a firecracker. We got to take him out. He he's just he's a loose cannon. So he's like Trump <laughs> of the day, you know. Not to get Trump involved, I'm just saying he was really he's just boom. He just more controlled, obviously. It's an insult to James. Morally, ethically, but made better character. I'm just saying his, and his, 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 his fear people had of him because they didn't know what he was going to do. Yes, is there a question back there, babe, or comment? Vicky just joined. Okay. So there, there's the Apostle James and, and about him. So I'm going to draw, I should, I should, the third one now. So the third one to look at here is going to look at Peter. Because I believe that the next two we should look at would be Peter and then Andrew because they're two brothers. So what I want to do is, again, we look at the Apostles and, and reference to I want to start with John because I believe that John was the most uh, privileged of them all and the most beloved of them all because the scripture says so. And I want to lead with him because we led with him. I want to cover his brother because they're tied together. So we went to James. Now we're going to Peter because Peter's no slouch. He's the face and voice of Christianity. We know that. He became, he be, well, I was going to say when he died here, excuse me. He died 
about A.D. 68. And he was the face and voice of Christianity through the book of Acts. Chapter 1 all the way through chapter 11. I mean, he's the man. All the way through chapter 1. After that, it's all Paul. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Paul 24-7, pretty much. So, but he was the face and voice of Christianity from the book of Acts, chapters 1 through 11. And, and Peter, of course, we know, as his name was Cephas, his name was, uh, excuse me, Simon Barjona, but Jesus changed his name. I'll put it on here, sorry. So, Simon Barjona, which means basically son of Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. His name was changed. Cephas, which means small stone. All right, that's what his name means. It means small stone. And now with this, uh, we know that when he was when he was killed, he was crucified. Whoops. He was crucified upside down. By Nero, who's a devil, so I mean, he's a jerk. So Emperor Nero killed Paul and Peter. Would you want to be him at the judgment seat? I mean, good gracious. Other than the Pontius Pilate, that's the second worst guy you want to be. I mean, Pontius Pilate is the one who ordered the hit on Jesus, if you will. Well, the Jews the one who was charged with his death, but Pontius Pilate carried it out. And Nero carried out the two people who were iconic after Christ. Took him out. Wow. And then Agrippa, here it's third in line with James. Those three guys are the, are the three worst. That's the evil axis of, of, of people that killed. You got Pilate who killed Jesus. You got, you got Nero who killed Paul and Peter. And you got Agrippa, Herod Agrippa, who, the second, who killed James. Those three guys, I mean, th that's bad news for all those dudes. So uh, anyway, I, I digress. So you go into uh, this tradition t uh, teaches about Peter that, let me see. Oh, this is interesting. I've got to... <laughs> Tradition says, tradition, this is interesting now, tradition states that, that he dictated, or I was going to say he, I put Peter, I want you to know who he is, that Peter dictated the gospel of Mark and Mark wrote it down. So they believe that Mark did not actually get inspired by God himself, that it was Peter inspired by God dictating to Mark from a prison cell to write it. Wow. Wow. Interesting. That's what they say. That's what they're saying. Now, I don't know if that's true, but they're saying it. So it states that Peter dictated. Here's why they say that. They say it because Mark, if you read it, is the one boss gospel that's unique to Peter's vantage point. It's the only gospel that says Peter, when Jesus said to him, for example, I'll show you. Here's what they say. This is the one reason. There's a lot of reasons why they say it, but the real nail in the coffin, no pun intended there. So you look at the, the real issue there is when, when Jesus is, um, right here, when he, let me see, let me go back. Da, 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 da. Okay, and it's in Mark chapter 14 when he, they say because he highlights this, this phrasing here in verse 37 when at the, at the Garden of Gethsemane and verse 37 of Mark 14 when he comes and finds them sleeping, he says to Peter, Simon, sleep you? Could you, could you not keep awake a single hour and watch and pray if you're going to trial for the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak? So they, they claim, so for example, if you go back to to Matthew, if you read this story again, and Matthew, 
when he comes back, there's no mention of him coming to Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26. There's no mention of, of, of Peter except, for, excuse me, in the same way. Let me rephrase that. In verse 40, it says, he says to Peter, is it so you could not keep awake with me an hour, uh, a single hour? Whereas in Mark, he adds more to the, to the statement that Jesus made. There's no mention of the statement he makes here where he says, he says, Simon, he calls him Simon. Whereas over here, it just says Peter in, in Matthew 26, 40. The story doesn't include the name Simon. So they're trying to, they're inferring that Peter had more of an endearing memory of it. And he added to it, and he says, Sleepest thou, could you not keep awake a single hour? Whereas over in, and he finds Peter sleeping and says to him, Could you not keep awake a single hour? So the way in which it's phrased, I think it's a more personal recalling of what happened, inspired by the Holy Spirit, versus the account given more indirectly. That's one of their arguments, for example. And I say, okay, and there's other comments like that they make, but the book of Mark gives more of a different personal touch when it comes to the events with Peter. I'm like, okay. So they can't, there's nothing to prove that. But even if it is true, it's still inspired by God. All they're saying is that God inspired Peter to dictate to Mark to write it. Just like, for example, Luke was inspired by God, but it wasn't Luke who knew the story. He got it from Paul. Right? So, because Paul knew it because he was told, he told Luke. So, you think about it, there's no, that's why they, that, that's also why they say that. They say, they say, as Luke was to Paul, Mark was to Peter. That's what they say in tradition. I'm like, interesting. Now, I've never heard that before in my life. So, I started studying this passage, I mean, this, this topic of the 12 apostles. So, they say, as Luke was to Paul, a, 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 a proselyte is what Luke was. And, and he came over into this realm where Mark was a Jew. Um, that would make sense because Paul was an apostle of the Gentiles. So Luke was a proselyte who was a doctor attendant to, to Paul, whereas they say Mark was an endearing, again, attendant and, and mentor to Peter. And just as Paul dictated to Luke the story about what he didn't see firsthand, Peter dictated to Mark. So they say. Now, I don't know that. That's what the tradition says. Interesting. But it does not change the fact but it's still an inspired by God book. The question is, did God go through Peter to dictate it to Mark? Or did he go right directly to Mark? I don't know. The question with Luke's the same way. People say, Paul could have told Luke all day long, but there's, there's still some that say God told Luke directly from the inspiration he got from Paul. So it, it, it doesn't change the fact that the bottom line is the book you have in front of you is God's word inspired through that man, period. It just depends on how God did it. Did he go through another vessel to get to that writer's hand? So now, tradition also says uh, that, let me see here. Oh, so we got also tradition tells us, uh, well, not tradition, but the scripture tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 1, we forget this about Peter, forget about Peter. Peter, Peter showed, Peter showed great remorse. He showed great remorse and grief. Which is, yeah. Remorse, grief, love for Judas. Because you're talking six weeks later, you're talking six weeks after his death, after, after Judas's suicide. Peter, Peter, want, Peter addresses the issue of Judas. Peter says, he was of us. And if you look at the book of Acts, I'll show you this about Peter. You forget this, this, this sensitive part of Peter. He was a very sensitive man. And you think about this issue. That's why he was hurt when Jesus said, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Hurt his feelings, no doubt. He was, a, he was an emotional guy. But when you read in the book of Acts chapter 1 and, and verse 16, when he talks, when Peter was standing up in verse 15, in the midst of the brethren, and in verse 16 he says, Necessary for the scriptures to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David foretold concerning that Judas who became a guide, which means he led the way, and to those who apprehended Jesus. For he was numbered among us and obtain the lot of his service. Wow. Peter wants, to wants them to remember, it was just scripture being fulfilled, man. Don't hate your brother. 
he's part of scripture fulfillment. But he had, brings him up, and he, and he even goes on. He didn't stop there. He says in verse 18, For this man, therefore, purchased the field with the wages of the wickedness, of his injustice. And by the way, when it says he's the lot of his service, that's the lot of his ministry. He obtained, the word lot is the portion. So Peter points out, Peter points out, Judas is, so he's the first one. So those who say, oh, you believe Judas is saved? No one believes that. Where did that first come from? Peter. Peter started this thought process because Peter said that he had, that Peter points out that Judas had the lot of service, which equals a portion of the ministry. That's what he said. That's what he said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 17. And he goes on and he says in verse 19, well, in verse 18, 18 and falling head first, had foremost, he burst in the middle and all his bowels were poured out and is known as the dwelling in Jerusalem. So they in the field called it in their own language, al which is the field of blood. But he goes on and he said, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling be desolate, let no one dwell in it, and let another take his office. And that word office is episcopy, which is overseer. Hello. Let another take his office. And the word office there is overseer. The same word used for overseer, and that's in verse 20. So in verse 20, he says that as well. And he says in verse 21, necessary therefore that those men having associated with all of us at the time in which the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, and he starts talking about who to, who, to, who to pick out. You know? So interesting enough that Peter is overlooked often as just being this guy who has a foot in his mouth all the time. Everybody describes him as that. But they leave out the sentimental part of Peter. So I'm going to tell you that Peter was, so he's, he's a sentimental guy. He was sentimental. Because it was, he's, he's famous for Jesus saying, Jesus saying three times, do you love me? And he was the one that before this happened, right? <coughs> but before this, before he was heartbroken, I'm going to say, over his brother. Over his brother's death. No one else brings it up. The other apostles don't go, yeah, I remember Judas, man. No one ever said, yeah, he put his, he put his hand in the, in, the, in the ditch and he betrayed our Lord. No one brings him in. He just makes the statement of who he was, that he was, that he says, and, and he points out he has a lot of his service, the portion of the ministry, and he had an office of overseership. How do you, <laughs> think about that. He had a portion of the ministry as an overseer. You're going to tell me he wasn't a believer in Christ as the Messiah. You're crazy. Peter himself, after the resurrection, says this. Not before. Not during the crucifixion, not, at, not, before, not before he committed suicide. After his suicide, makes these comments. So after the resurrection, after his suicide, a full, clear 2020 vision says, this is what the deal is. So don't give me this malarkey garbage that, well, he didn't see it full, full scale. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yes? I think he said Peter is mentioning things that are mentioned in several chapters of Psalms 109, yep. 69, 41, all are references to Judas. Yep. He's referencing scripture, and it tells you that a couple things. One, he knew scripture a lot better than people realized, but more importantly, I think the sentimental aspect of bringing up Judas is a very big deal because it's six weeks after he died. Why, why are you bringing him up? Again, it's six weeks later, man. It's six weeks later. He's still on your mind? If you don't care about somebody, why... I mean, think about that. I don't know about you, but I can tell you that I, I, deal, I deal with people all the time what I do for a living. And, and on the other side of this, on the you know, insurance side, 
and people's grief cycles are different. So if you grieve, if you, if you grieve somebody, and then six weeks later you can bring up and start talking about them like this in an endearing way about what they used. You don't talk about the bad. You're mentioning the good about what happened. You mentioned the bad too. Don't get me wrong. He mentions both of them, bad and good. He's bringing it up. Six weeks later, I don't, I don't know. Some might say he's just doing the, the obligatory process of, yeah, I don't think so. It's more, it's more than that. It's more than that. Did yes. Did you see yourself when he was on the same level as Judas when he denied him? Yes, I mentioned that when we studied the book of Acts because <laughs> Judas is the only one that Peter could relate to that they both denied Jesus face to face. And they both had that recourse of sadness and grief and sorrow and bitterness. The difference is Judas didn't find forgiveness and Peter did. Which is why Jesus said when he came back in the room and he said, that you lose on heaven, that you lose on earth is lose in heaven. That you retain here is retain there. Meaning, you gotta you gotta have forgiveness. You gotta turn to me to be forgiven of your sin. And if not, then you're gonna retain it. You gotta re forgive your sin. You, gotta, you just can't you just can't turn from your sin. You gotta turn to me, or else you're gonna retain that sense of guilt and shame. You're gonna carry it with you, like Judas. Remember your brother? That's why he's not here. Because Peter's going, oh my God, literally, my God. I hear what you're saying because that's. That's what he's doing. He's now finally realizing he has to let this go. And later on, Jesus makes it even more clear when he goes a couple weeks later to show up Galilee with that charcoal fish fry. That is insane. That smell resonated with him. <laughs> Last time I smelt that, it was the worst day of my life. I denied you. And now you're using it to show me restoration. Wow. Just redefining that same moment in a different way. Yes? Uh, Pam said, where are we? We're in Acts, Acts chapter 1. I'm just, I'm just quoting other scriptures, some other places. Acts chapter 1, 17. So now, we're and, still on Peter. Vicky, Vicky said, just like Matthias became a replacement apostle by lot, but the question is, the apostles voted for lot by Math Matthias. by lot for Matthias. Was it God then who gave Judas his lot? Certainly the apostles didn't. Absolutely. Ju Judas... I mentioned uh, before this, this guy uh, who's, who's painting the apostles, whose book I'm referencing as one of the main references for this study, uh, Ken Wyatt. He mentions his daughter, Saul, he did not paint Judas. And she said, Daddy, I thought you have all the apostles, but I don't see Judas anywhere. And he said, because he's the one who betrayed our Lord and had him murdered. And then she said, as a little girl, but Daddy, how can you improve on God's choices? Ooh. Boom. And that's exactly the thing with the apostles. They knew, like you just said. They knew. You can't improve on God's choices. Whether you like him or hate him, who chose him? Did we choose him to be our brother and, and, our, and the ministry to follow Christ? No, we did not. Our Lord chose him as he chose us. How could we dare not be empathetic and sympathetic to his death and his loss? We have to. That's He was put with us. We didn't choose each other. The Lord chose us to be together. So the reason why we all were together. Uh, it just shows a lot of, you know, insight to Peter. I think this is the beginning of him prior to being Pentecost and power by the Holy Spirit. You can see the beginnings of his face and voice of Christianity, God working on him in his heart to prepare him even more so for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to take him off on that biggest sermon he gave after the Pentecost. So also, I'll, I'm going to tell you that Peter, Peter, which, uh, by the way, what you don't know about him when he was crucified upside down, what you didn't know about him, this is profound to me when I saw this. Upside down, he was, he was actually, um, before this, chained to a post upright, which means, in other words, his, hand, his hands were chained upright, so he couldn't, so if you, if you don't stand, then you have this big pressure on your shoulders pulling you upward. If he stands, then his, his knees and legs start to hurt. He never was out of this position for months, awaiting his, his trial to be, to be murdered. So he's chained to this post like this, and he, and he has to stand. And if he doesn't stand, then, the, then that chain just jerks his shoulders up. And that must hurt like the dickens, man. That must hurt so bad. And the room, pitch black. Oh, nice. It's crazy. And by the way, that prison was the same prison that Paul was in. They were in the same prison, different cells. It's known for its, its, its absolute darkness and its torturous confinement leading up into your death. So Peter and Paul experienced hellacious pain and suffering before, because they were being tortured too, by the way, before they got killed, before they got murdered. So this is what Peter went through. He was chained to this post upright. You wondered, you know, if they were so tortured, 
Yeah. It, so. So. They claim, so the tradition says, tradition states that he wrote, that he wrote, um, that Peter's, that Peter's two epistles, so I told you where he died in 8068, so Peter's two epistles were written in 8064 up into AD 68, which means that they believe that it's possible he wrote both of them or one of them while he was in prison. Wow, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Well, he was dictating it. This is where they get to the mark. This is where they get. This is where they get to the mark uh, comment. They believe he was dictating the mark to write it too. They believe second. They believe second. Well, they believe he came as a visitor and 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 he was there to talk to. So they believe that that Second Peter tradition says that he maybe dictated that to Mark also to write. Interesting. Interesting. But that one he was called Second Peter still. But many say that First Peter was written by him. That's no doubt, they say. But Second Peter, they claim, that was inspired by God to Peter, but since he was chained, it's possible he could have dictated that to Mark to write, which is why it was shorter than the first one, because he was near the end of his death, and, and his life is coming up on death. I, it's all conjecture. I don't know that. There's nothing that proves that because the early church fathers agree that they say that he wrote it, period. But the, the tradition says they confer that possibly since Luke was likened unto Paul as Mark was likened unto Peter, that maybe he dictated it to Mark to write down. Even though God inspired Peter and it's still his epistle, he may have been unable to write. And that's why he said to write that. It's interesting. So in any, in any event, it's still God inspired, still God's word. It's just how it got to the page is interesting. So and then you have also... Um, this is interesting too. Uh, so, in this in this point, it says that so it's the also states um, tradition. Oh, tradition also says tradition says that he also you'll love this. That also Peter baptized over fifty people. At some point, they said he was unchained before he, because he wasn't there always chained. He was unchained at some point. And they said that he, his 50 people were baptized by him in a spring of water in the, in the prison. I'm like, really? That's interesting. 50 people? That's a lot of people, man. <laughs> to be... Baptized, and so they're saying he even his captors were totally affected by his his testimony. So, so also as we see um, something else that's interesting about Peter, very interesting about Peter, as you say that they say he traveled. So the tradition again, I want to say they tradition. I want to make sure I put that on here. So tradition says, tradition states that Peter traveled. This is rather interesting to me. That he traveled in Persia, which is modern day Iran. So I'll put that on here so you don't forget that is. He went over to England. He went over to modern day France and Belgium. And then, of course, Rome. That's where they say Peter went. Okay? Now, that's what the tradition says. Now, we know he went to Rome. That's a fact. That we know for sure. He was there. Other parts, I don't know. <laughs> that's not in the Bible, so I can't tell you that. But that's modern-day stuff because he went throughout this region here, they said. So I don't, I don't know. They, that's what tradition said. Okay? So now... Also, uh, again, they say that they say he they say he and Paul died same day in different parts of the city in AD sixty eight. That's what they say. Now, if you look on the what do you call it? Um, 
online Google Wikipedia stuff, they're going to say AD 67. Because remember, they count Christ's death to AD 33, and it wasn't, it was 34. So that's why they're off by a year. So you just go to forward one more year. That's why it's AD 68. So in any event, when you look at this, um, they also, here's the, here's the real thing about Peter, though. Peter does a very interesting, powerful thing that I did not even realize myself, not to give credit to him, but I should have, and shame on me. And it's in 1 Peter, or no, 2 Peter, excuse me, is it 2 Peter? Yeah. It's in 2 Peter, in chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, I want to show you. Peter does a very powerful thing that I have known for a very long time, but I have never seen it like this. Until all of a sudden I was like, oh, interesting, Lord. That's very interesting. I didn't catch it before in the timeline. So look at 2 Timothy, 2, no, 2, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and watch what he says. And reckon as patience of our Lord as salvation. Now when you read this, remembering he's in a prison. I just described. Makes it even more powerful what he's saying, right? Even as our beloved, apostle, beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom imparted to him, wrote to you, it also makes more sense that he's writing this from a prison cell with Paul may bring him in a cell. Now you know why he's on his mind. It makes more sense now. You're like, gosh, wow, I didn't know that, right? Then it says, well, watch what he says in verse 16. This is where the key part is. So also in all of his epistles, meaning Paul, speaking in them concerning these things, meaning that we talked about the day of the Lord, day of God, concerning these things in which some things are hard to understand, which the uninstructed and unstable pervert. Now watch, this is what the key phrase is. They pervert so, so also as also the other scriptures to their own destruction. Whoa, 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 whoa. Peter just equated Paul's writings to scripture. Wait a second. That means everybody, the lion sack of, of, of idiots when they say, oh, canonization took place in the Council of Nicaea. It took place right there. Peter just told you Paul's writings were scripture in AD 60, whatever it was, 64, 68. Holy mackerel. So Peter is telling you right then and there, Paul's writings are scripture. Wow. So there was no canonization they were discussing. They knew that Paul, because remember, everybody, everybody's not against Christianity. They said, well, they had to determine which books were what. Peter already knew that books was, that Paul wrote scripture. It was, it was, it was 100% scripture. So Peter says that Paul's writings, Paul's writings are scripture. And if you're wondering, yes, that word is graphos, which means writings, which you go, that could be anything. No, 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 no. It's the same exact word Jesus used when he said he opened up the scriptures and told them about himself and the Psalms and the law and the prophets. So if you're thinking that, think again. The word graphos, which is scriptures, is used by other prophets in the Bible to mean the sacred writings of the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. And Peter just put Paul's writings on the same level as that. Shazam. So there's your first declarative nature of someone who wants to say to you and me, well, how do you know it's God's word? Because Peter said it was God's word because he knew. He knew. Well, how did he know? God told him. I don't, I'll tell you. But it wasn't, don't, don't tell me this malarkey that guys voted and said, I don't like that one. Well, that did happen later with some other books. It, that did happen with Second Peter, actually, coincidentally, which is ironic. Second Peter is one of the last books entered into the canonization of Scripture. The point being, there was a canonization of all the 27 books of the New Testament. That was true. But the point is that not all of them are subjected to some people that were 300 years later deciding what was God's word and what wasn't. The point is, the apostles themselves already knew that some of those books that were written, because remember, they didn't have access to every one of them at the time. So I'm going to go over this with you, when was written what? Because John didn't write Revelation until later on. All the apostles were dead when John wrote Revelation. They were dead. Nobody was alive when he wrote Revelation. Matter of fact, many would argue many were not alive when he wrote any of his epistles. First, second, third John. Now the book of John, he wrote that one. They were alive to see that. I didn't tell you about that one. He wrote the book of John. Uh, they say he wrote that right around the end of his life too, by the way. So yeah. So basically, so all of, I put this on the board. So all of John's books, whoops, hello. All John's books were written after all the apostles died.
So you got it. It's interesting. All of John's books were after the apostle died. The book of John, the first, second, third epistle of John, the revelation, they're all dead. Which, by the way, we haven't gotten to Matthew yet, but the church in Antioch, that's why the gospel they used the most was Matthew. It was written first. That's why. That was the first gospel they had. They, wanted to, they, they, they referenced that quite a bit and didn't reference any other one. They didn't have John. <laughs> he wasn't written yet. So interesting that the synoptic gospels of the synoptic, Matthew was the one they used the most. And the church of Antioch proves that with that statement they have in their, their history. That's a fact. That's not tradition. That's a fact. Yes? Tim said, did he write Revelation before the book of John? No. They, they, well, no. Tradition says that they don't know when any of the books were written. Exactly, the year, to your question. So if the question is, when was Revelation written? And the epistles, for that matter, or the gospel? No one knows the exact dates. They just know that they, everybody traditionally speaks to the fact that he wrote them in his latter years of life. And Revelation was the last one he wrote. That's all we know. Because everybody, everybody says that before he went to Patmos, no books were written. And that's why, by him. And that's why they say that all those books, the gospel, three epistles, and Revelation, were all written in Patmos, which is when he spent the last years of his life, which was after all the apostles were dead, which means that we don't know which was written when. So could he have written Revelation first? Sure, he could have. No one knows that. He was on an island by himself. It was a penal colony, by the way, for prisoners to go to, so it wasn't like you could visit. You know, So it was not, in the prison that Paul and Peter were in, that's in Rome, that's different, that, that's land side. Over here, they were so bad criminals, they put them on an island. So the way you go there is if you're the guard or if you're the prisoner. There's no visitors there. So it's interesting how he got these books. So no one knows for sure when he wrote them, to your, to your question. They just know that all those existed after he was dead. They had these